welcome to lecture six. Um, we're going to talk about comparisons with the two-way vector ANOVA. Um, actually, this is going to be a very short lecture because everything that we talk about here is going to be exactly the same as we had back with one-way ANOVA, just with that additional layer of complexity because you've got, you've got two independent variables and their intersection that you could be interested in. So the comparisons, they're both going to be the pre-planned comparisons that I'm going to talk about as well as the post hoc comparisons. And I'm going to throw in there the, uh, the, uh, the, the trend analysis. Um, all three of those, I strongly urge you to go back to the lecture where we first talked about contrasts, rewatch that, and then compare that with what we're going to do today. So we'll start with the pre-planned comparisons. Um, so we're going to start with that test uh, with the null hypothesis. L, again, is going to be our contrast. And as we recall, L, back in the one independent variable phase, was just the sum over I of, were they A's? I think they're A's. AI mu I. A linear combination of those population means. Were they I's? Yeah, who cares? Today, with the two sample, you're going to be adding up over two indices, a i j mu i j. That's it. Still a linear combination of the population means. We required L. In order for L to be a contrast, we had one requirement, and that was the sum over i of the a i was equal to zero. That was in the one-way case. In the two-way case, we're just going to do it over both indices, and they have to have zero. Again, nothing new. The concepts, the theory, all of that is the same. The only difference is we're adding additional subscripts to take into consideration that second dimension, that second variable. So again, I strongly urge you to go back to lecture, I think it was lecture four, where we talked about contrasts. Could have been lecture three. It's one of those earlier lectures, probably lecture three, um, because that's going to give you a much better introduction to what we're doing here. Really, we're not doing anything. At least we're not doing anything new. So let me give you an example of a null hypothesis that may be of interest. Um, I'm looking specifically at the DFW data, the DFW example. Uh, well, technically, I'm not looking at it because I don't know where I placed it. But as I recall, I'm going to erase this term. The data looks something like this. We have professors, and we have courses, and the three courses were STAT 2013, STAT 2023, and STAT 2053. And there were four professors. Uh, Forsberg was one. I think Michelson was the second one. Then there was Cheney. And what was that last one? I've got it as W on the list there. Boom. Inside each of these cells, there's a population mean. So the true, or the population, uh, the FW rate, or stat 2023 with Professor Forsberg is mu 21, mu sub 2 comma 1, or mu sub 21. For Michelson, for stat 2053, that average, the population average again, is mu of 3, 2. Cheney, the population average for the FW rate in STAT 2013 is mu 13. So these are population means. Again, we're always trying to draw conclusions about the population means, given samples. 
Now, no hypothesis that may be interesting is comparing the DFW rates for Forsberg and Cheney. Ignoring the class, just looking at the DFW rates for Forsberg versus Cheney. So what would that null hypothesis be? That would be mu11 plus mu12, I'm sorry, plus mu21 plus mu31, or three, because there's three of them. And the null hypothesis, since it's going to be null, that'll be equals mu13 uh, plus mu. 2, 3, plus mu, 3, 3, again, over 3. So that could be the null hypothesis that interests us. It may not be, but it could be the null hypothesis that interests us. Now again, remember that when we're doing contrast, they always have to be in the form of L equal to some number, and that some number is almost always 0, by the way. So that means that we are going to multiply through by 3. I'm to get rid of the fractions. I hate fractions almost as much as I hate wire hangers, and then move everything to one side. So that means that our null hypothesis here is mu11 plus mu21 plus mu31 minus mu13 minus mu23 minus mu33. This part is L, and this part is 0. This is, in terms of the population, what we observe is always going to be L hat. And in this case, L hat, or in, in general, L hat is just going to equal the L function, but instead of the population parameters, we're going to use the sample, param uh, sample statistics. So in this case, L hat is going to equal to y, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, y bar 1, 1, that's for mu 1, 1, plus y bar 1, 2, 1, plus y bar 3, 1. Notice every place we see mu, we're substituting in y bar. Sample mean is our unbiased estimator of the population mean. Minus y bar 1, 3, minus y bar 2, 3, minus y bar 3, 3. That is our observed statistic. Now in this case with our, I'm going to have to put you on pause and find a copy of that. So you do the same thing, find a copy of the data. Okay, I found the data. Actually it was on my computer, so I'm just, it's on the screen now. So what we <clears throat> so what we observed for y bar one one, which is Forsberg 2013, is just 15 plus 18 over 2, which is 16.5. For y bar two one, that's going to be the, the average in cell for Forsberg in stat 2023. That's going to be 15 plus 19 over 2, which is 17. For y bar 3, 1, it's going to be the average for Forsberg in stat 2053, which is 31 plus 33 over 2, which is 32. Now we'll do the same thing for the Cheney data. The average Cheney DFW in stat 2013 is 27 plus 33 over 2, which is 30. y bar 2, 3 is 28. And y bar 3, 3 is 29. So let's calculate that statistic. We'll use my handy dandy calculator. Some people use this as a phone. I don't see it. Why would you talk into a calculator? It's silly. 16.5 plus 17 plus 32, minus 30, minus 28, minus 29. So we observed L hat is 
it's negative 21.5. That was a bit bigger than I expected, so let me just look to make sure that it makes sense. So there's about 14 there and about 11 there. Yeah, that's about right. So there's our test statistic, or there's our L hat. What do we do with it? We do with it the exact same thing that we did with it back in the one-way analysis. We calculate a test statistic. After the midterm, I'm going to clean this whole thing, make it nice and white. Remember the test statistic? I'll do it in blue. In the one-way ANOVA, this was the test statistic. In this two-way ANOVA, it's going to be that. Because really, what, what is AIJ? It's just these coefficients. So we're just making sure that we add up all the coefficients. Square them, of course. So in this case, we could also and as we did back in the one-way NOVA, we can turn this into an F statistic, which is just squaring the whole thing. And again, as we did back with the one-way NOVA case, we could figure out what, uh, we could transform this in some way and just collecting terms in a way to get a mean squared for the contrast. And this is going to be, oops, I'm sorry, that should be squared. So this is going to be our mean squared contrast. MSL, I don't recall though. And this is going to be distributed according to an F with one numerator degree of freedom and a DFE denominator degrees of freedom. Again, the book uses MSW for within. I'm going to use MSE for error because most sources use MSE. How do we know that this is 1? Well, when we square a t, make it into an f, it's always a 1. So mathematically, it's got to be 1. Since the degrees of freedom for the numerator is 1, that means not only is this going to be the mean squared contrast, but it's also going to be the sum of squared contrast, because the mean squared is always equal to the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. None of that's changed. It's all the same. The only thing that's changed is we've got two dimensions. So I need to calculate L hat, which I did. Calculate L, which is 0, according to our null hypothesis. MSC, we're going to use a computer to get the MSC, because doing this by hand is just ridiculous at this point. N is the number of replications in each. Here, N is going to equal 2. The AIJs, this is A11, A21, A31, A13, A23, A33. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that sum of the AIJs is going to equal 6 in this case. So I'm going to calculate the mean squared error. When you, when you break off into your R or your SAS group at this point, SAS video at this point, um, you'll see how to calculate the mean squared error same exact way as you did it with the one-way ANOVA. Let the computer do the hard work for you. And here we are back. Um, I did the calculations on the computer and you'll be able to see these in the next video. Um, so this is going to equal negative 21.5 minus 0. You don't want to do the T or the F. Let's do the T. 
um, divided by the square root of mean squared error was 28.62. And is 2 because that's the number of replications. Uh, to, oops, I should put 2 instead of n. Uh, 2 times 6. Um, 6 because um, this is a 1, this is a 1, this is a 1, this is a negative 1, a negative 1, a negative 1. So 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 because we're scoring it each time. So according to my calculator, this comes out to be Remember, since we're using the T1, this is going to be distributed. If I use blue, this is going to be distributed according to a T distribution with DFE, degrees of freedom. The number of degrees of freedom for the residuals is 12. Going to our textbook, table is it 2, A2. I think it's A2, it better be A2. There it is, A2, uh, 12 degrees of freedom. And we want um, alpha equals 0 0.05. Two-tailed test, 2.1788. That's our critical value. This is what we observe. It's more extreme than the critical value. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, we conclude that the, uh, that the average um, DFW rate for me, I mean for Professor Forsberg, is not the same as that of Professor Cheney. In fact, because we know that our observed statistic is negative, that tells us that Professor Cheney's DFW rate is significantly higher than Professor Forsberg's. Let's draw this in red. That's the distribution of the test statistic, T. Critical value is 2.1788. Observed negative 2.32. Since what we observe is in the rejection region, we reject the null hypothesis. Because the test is what we observed is negative, and the way that we have our null hypothesis set up, that means that this part is greater than this part. Professor Cheney's DFW rate is significantly higher than Professor Forsberg's. This looks a lot like one-way analysis of variance. It looks an awful lot like one-way analysis of variance. The mechanics are about the same. Interpretation is a little bit different because now we have two subscripts on the A, but that's it. And so, with that in mind, everything we talked about in contrast in Lecture 3 with the one-way case applies to the two-way case. Everything we talked about post-hoc testing applies in this case as well. Everything we've talked about with respect to trend analysis applies in this case as well. So rewatch lecture three, and every place where I use the word one to, uh, to indicate one way, substitute in two. Wherever you see a single subscript of I, subscri uh, subs 
put in an I and a J. And everything follows. So that's the end of this video. From here, you'll go and do the actual really tough stuff. Um, you'll go, if you're a SAS person, you'll do the SAS video. If you're an R person, you'll do the R video. There you go.